Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we wanna say thanks for questions coming from our audience of Smith Weekly, including Jared W., John B., Paul M., Jackie A., and Craig S. We have a new guest on the program today. Mr. Ian Plymer has joined us. Ian is the Emeritus Professor at University of Melbourne. Mr. Plymer is also an author, as well as a geologist and company director in the natural resource sector. Ian has recently put out a new book series on energy, climate, and more titled The Little Green Book. You can learn more about the new book series and past titles from Ian via the publisher, Connor Court, at their website, connorcourtpublishing.com.au. Ian, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Well, Ian, it's good to have you on and some interesting subject matter here to discuss. And I just want to give a, a special thanks to David Daintree for connecting us. Where do we start off here is there's really a lot of things to discuss, but let's talk your background first to establish your expertise and experience as you've done a lot and are still doing a lot in your life with work in the mining sector, your work as a geologist, work as a professor, helping to pass on experience and wisdom, also doing that by putting together thought-provoking books and also bringing logic to the discussion about energy, climate, carbon. And not only are you battling with people that don't agree with your views, you're also fighting cancer. When do you sleep? When do you get some personal time? <laughs> well, uh, to answer the first part of your question, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. The only way out of that is to get an education, which I did. I won a scholarship to university, which was the only way I could go. I had always, since I was a child, had a fascination for geology and the university just enriched that passion. I then went and worked underground when I had my first uh, degree. I then came back and did a PhD. I then worked underground again, and then I went into an academic position for a little while, I then went into the mining industry for a while, using exploration. In fact, in that stage of my life, I was the most creative I've ever, ever been. And in a mining company, I was, I was allowed freedom. I could publish anything. I could go anywhere, and universities never allowed me to do that. And then I was picked off by a university. Later, I went to another university where I had a chair. That was in 1985. I had my second chair in Munich in Germany in 1990. I had my third chair at the University of Melbourne in 1992. And I had my fourth chair at the University of Adelaide in 19... No, that wasn't... That was 2006. So since 2006, uh, I was there for five or six years, and then I moved back into the mining industry now as a director of a number of major uh, operations. So I've had that unusual blend of being paid to pursue my passion, being able to work following my curiosity in science, working in the mining industry and working in academia. And I've had really a very, very rich life. I've dodged a lot of bullets in my life, the cancer that I have, and I'm currently talking to you from a clinic. <laughs> uh, that's how tight life is. Uh, I, I think it's just one of these things that gets thrown at you and I'm still dodging bullets. So life's been very, very good to me, but uh, I've helped it being good to me by getting out of bed early, by working hard, by studying, by um, trying to work with people and not against people. And my passion for science is all married to evidence, how you get evidence, what this evidence means, and how you can use this evidence. And I see the climate mantra is completely anti-scientific. They're not using the principles of science and everything that we are told is against what my science shows me. And that is that we've had climate change since the beginning of time. Lots of good stuff happening there and lots of stuff to, to get into and discuss. and. Just for sake of time, I'll save some of my thoughts here and organize them a bit as we go. But why don't we kick this off? Because you already mentioned it. I'd like to get to energy and other topics in a moment, Ian. But 
why don't you take us back to elementary or even middle school chemistry class, you know, depending on where you grew up and of course the school you went to, but what is carbon dioxide, CO2, and why is there a war on CO2? Well, carbon dioxide is a gas that is colorless, it's tasteless, you can't smell it, and this gas is the gas of life. All vegetation and algae use carbon dioxide as plant food. And this plant food then gets converted into carbon compounds, which then get eaten or used. And as humans, we eat carbon bearing foods. These carbon bearing foods get converted into carbon compounds in our body. These carbon compounds we excrete. We breathe in 0.04% of carbon dioxide and we breathe out 4%. It's obviously not poisonous because it's a gas that we excrete all the time. It's obviously not poisonous because if we're in a, a room full of people, the carbon dioxide content rises to about 0.1%. It is a gas that is the gas of life. It is also the gas of industry. So if you are making cement, making steel, making plastics, making fertilizers, these are the four basic commodities of the modern world. If you're making those, then you emit carbon dioxide. And the perfect way of destroying an economy is to have restrictions on carbon dioxide emissions or to stop emissions or to tax emissions. And that's actually what is happening now. So carbon dioxide is non-poisonous, it's a gas of life, yet there is an attack on carbon dioxide. And in my view, this attack is uh, an attack on the Western world. It's an attack to try to break down the strength and the structure of the Western world, such that we are uh, weakened, such that our industry is weakened, such that we have high unemployment and social problems, and on we go. So it's absolutely and totally illogical. We've had four atmospheres in the history of the planet. The first had quite a bit of methane and ammonia, a little bit of carbon dioxide. The second was very rich in carbon dioxide. The third one, which we have now, is rich in uh, oxygen, and we may well be evolving into a fourth atmosphere. Time will tell. So it's been a normal gas. Uh, limestone has 44% carbon dioxide in it. Dolomite has 48% carbon dioxide in it. That's a solid rock that has 48% gas in it. We have carbon dioxide coming out of volcanoes. We have 97% of all emissions on planet Earth are natural, most of which is coming out of the oceans, uh, out of volcanoes, out of uh, respiration. Only 3% of carbon dioxide ever emitted is of human origin. And we have to argue very, very strenuously because people ignore basic information. Carbon dioxide has an inverse solubility in water. So when you open up a, a soft drink or champagne, then it bubbles and it keeps bubbling as that bottle warms up. It's well understood chemically. It's a fundamental chemical in the history of the planet. We go to other planets and they have carbon dioxide. We go deep in the oceans, we find areas where there's liquid carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a normal gas, so to attack it defies logic to start with. But the logic is, let's break down Western civilization. It's convenient in the sense that we can't see it, can't smell it. It's a convenient one, I suppose, if you want to be sinister. You're right in the sense, okay, let's find something else to, to tax or let's find another vehicle or mechanism to ruin and control economies. Just like what we've seen most recently over the last few years with things like COVID, which also were a convenient mechanism. Let me come back to the elementary room. I don't want to go too far away and get back to chemistry class. Uh, and we'll come back to some of this other stuff, including the concept of time, which is a whole other thing I'd like to discuss because you're a geologist. I'll come back to that. But when there's too much CO2, what happens? And when there's not enough CO2, Ian, what happens? We've had up to 20% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is now 0.04%. What has happened to that high carbon dioxide content atmosphere is that it's been sequestered out of the atmosphere into the oceans and precipitated as rocks, as limey rocks, as carbonate rocks, as um, coral atolls, uh, and goes into carbon-rich sediments. That process has been going on 
for a very long period of time. And in fact, since we've had complex multicellular life on planet Earth, we have been having a decrease in the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's gone from 0.7% to 0.04%. And that's been over the last 500 million years. We've had a decrease in atmospheric carbon dioxide content, so much so that plants have to evolve. And C4 plants like corn or sugarcane appeared, and they require less carbon dioxide. We are now at a very low point in carbon dioxide in the history of the planet. If we halved the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then all plant life would die. And this is why I hinted earlier that we may well be evolving into another atmosphere, and that might be one rich in nitrogen and argon. So the atmosphere is evolving. We are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It has been taken out by life. It's gone into shells. It's gone into limestones it's gone into carbon rich sediments and then we had a period of time when there was a bacteria around that uh, were doing different things and so we were able to have a massive accumulation of vegetation and this vegetation built up to give us the great coal deposits and this occurred between about 300 and 250 million years ago and that pulled huge amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased again, naturally, um, but it wasn't to the level of when the coal started to form. We now have bacteria that will decompose rotting vegetation into methane, and uh, they didn't exist when we formed the major coal deposits. So over time, we can see there's been an evolution of life, an evolution of the atmosphere, and of course, an evolution of the rocks, and all of that is in tandem. So Carbon dioxide is just a signal telling us that the planet is changing. And we are actually living in times where uh, carbon dioxide is very, very low compared with the past. Uh, we're living in times when life is not thriving compared with the past, when there was much higher carbon dioxide. So you could argue, as the founder of Greenpeace does, Patrick Moore, you could argue that we need to put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to stop vegetation um, struggling with plant food in the air. And uh, Patrick argues that we should be burning coal, we should be burning fossil fuels, put it back where it came from, and try to have the atmosphere um, changed such that plant life can thrive. Now, I'm not a great believer in trying to change planetary systems. I think uh, you're, you're kidding yourself if you think you can change a major planetary system. But there is some concern in some circles about the lack of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Come back here for just a moment and clarify. So too much CO2 is potentially less of a problem than not enough CO2 where plant life and potentially humans can die. Very much so, just... very much so, yes. Is there a concentration where too much is? No, we, we've had times when we've had a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. We didn't have runaway global warming. We actually had ice ages. And um, okay. we have had six major ice ages during which there are glaciations and interglacials when the ice expands and the ice contracts. And each one of these started when we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. And we can go right back in time and look at these major ice ages and say, well, how can this happen? How can we have ice in two of the great ice ages? It was at the equator and at sea level. How can we have ice yet the atmosphere had 20 percent carbon dioxide in it? How can that be possibly the case? And it is the case. It means that what we're being taught and told about carbon dioxide is demonstrably wrong. So it's a good thing to look at to fear. You can't smell it. You can't see it. It's like radiation. You can't smell it or see it. It's like viruses and bacteria. You can't see them. You can't smell them. And they're just wonderful if you want to have a scare campaign where you control people and can actually create more tax wealth. Yeah. As you and I've done in your line of work and also in mine, I remember when I was younger and when I was in university, I didn't learn a lot in university in, but I did learn some key things and that was responsibility. And another thing I learned was, I believe it was in a nutrition class amongst a history class as well, always question the narrative and the motives behind. And if you always come at it that way, 
you're eventually going to follow the money, what have you, you're going to come to your own conclusion if you're willing to do the work and you're always questioning that narrative. And you're absolutely and was, correct. Follow the money. It's always a yep. case to follow the money and coming with money is power. Uh, some people who might not be wealthy um, can be quite powerful. And so uh, always look at what is the self-interest. And if you look at the self-interest of the climate change group, most of the people who are climate scientists, they call themselves scientists, I would argue whether that's the case or not, most of them are eminently unemployable. If you didn't have them in a climate institute paid for by taxpayers, frightening us witless, they would be out of work. So, um, of course, it's in their self-interest to, to keep us frightened. Of course, it's in the government's self-interest to keep us frightened, be it COVID, be it um, X-rays, be it um, radiation, be it from nuclear devices, be it something like carbon dioxide. It's very, very much in a government's interest to do that. Now, we are also hardwired to be frightened. This is an evolutionary hangover where we were always looking over our shoulder, seeing what was going to get us. We are hardwired to be frightened, and that is being exploited. Yes, you're right. And also at the same time, uh, while we think we are somehow getting more sophisticated and smarter, Ian, you can make some arguments against that. And also <laughs> the fact that human beings are human beings. Um, last I checked, we still take in and exhale, and we go to the bathroom, we eat food. Uh, we have good times. We're pretty basic creatures, and that doesn't really change that much. No matter what kind of car you drive, what apartment you live in, in big city or what have you, the reality is it doesn't change. And so you always have to question the narrative. And for us, you know, especially for me, in investigating natural resource, junior natural resource equities, you know, that is an exercise of question and be skeptical about what this junior is promoting to the market. You've hit on something I touched on before. When I was in the mining industry in the 80s, I was running exploration for a major Australian company. And the board, to their great um, common sense, recognised that in exploration, you have to be curious. In exploration, you often have to go against the trend. You have to go in a different direction. Someone is claiming that this mineral deposit formed by this method think differently and you have to think differently in exploration and that to me is the way science should operate and i've always thought differently i've always been on the outer in many areas of my life because i use evidence i try to think differently i try to look at different conclusions and successful exploration companies are those who have people who are creative, who think differently, but have a great breadth of knowledge. And there might be a standard theory for the formation of a platinum deposit, but they do form other ways. And you can actually go back and look at the basic chemistry of platinum and say, hmm, in this environment, we might get a platinum deposit forming by a totally different mechanism, one that's not really promoted in the literature. Because the literature... The scientific literature is full of fads and fashions and most very unusual scientific papers that are highly creative, done by curious people, they don't get through the editorial process. So uh, you, you hit something which is very precious to me and that is having to think differently if you want to find a mineral deposit. Well said there. And that's similar too in the sense, you know, you mentioned COVID here too and, and the isolated physicians still today are still isolated in the community in the sense of their views have not been the mainstream view. You have to certainly appreciate uh, what those folks are saying and you have to respect what they're saying. It's interesting in some of the other things you said too, natural gas, methane gas, a lot of people know it as natural gas, oil deposits, that those are not only sources of energy, but is it safe to say that these have sequestered carbon? Yes, uh, I'm very much in favour of fossil fuels for a couple of reasons. Um, we saw in Europe and in the UK, they bought people out of peasantry. They bought people out of crippling poverty where uh, people died very young of simple diseases. We've seen this same change just recently in China. So fossil fuels have actually given us the middle class. Fossil fuels have given us longevity. They've given us a better diet. They've given us the ability to travel and broaden our mind. Um, we, we are 
uh, in the Western civilization, we are the beneficiaries of exporting fossil fuels. Now, if we didn't, we still would be chopping down forests to get the charcoal to make iron. We still would be killing whales to get the blubber to make oil, to have lanterns burned. Um, it is fossil fuels that have saved the forests. It's fossil fuels that have saved the whales. We had fossil fuel driven vehicles appear, especially in the US, where the streets were just full of horse poo. This was being washed into water wells. People drank that water and got sick. Some of them died. Once we had the motor car in the cities, that stopped all that horse poo poisoning people. So we have to thank fossil fuels for what they've given us. They also give us medicines. We use about 6,000 products in our life that have made from fossil fuels. We live in a, a world where plastics dominate. Well, plastics are made from fossil fuels. We eat well and to actually increase productivity, we use fossil fuels to make fertilizers. So we, we just cannot escape the fact that we are in a fossil fuel world. We have to use them. We might not necessarily use them for transport. There are other ways of transport, but to keep society going, we need fossil fuels. So one of the beefs I have with the so-called climate scientists is that they are beneficiaries of this wonderful world we live in. Uh, yet they want to they want to destroy it. They want to criticize it. Uh, you can't have it both ways. Yes, the use is there. Let's go over to coal for a sec. The transition off of coal fired power plants. Sorry to digress into energy here. That transition has taken many, many, many years. And, and if you look at the US, you know, we still have a pretty meaningful percentage of energy that comes from coal plants, which, by the way, would charge your electric vehicle in most cases, depending on where you live. But in general, that's what you're getting out of it. Or at least in a percentage form, a percentage of that electric vehicle charge is coming from fossil fuel source. You know, what's also interesting about that, Ian, is, is also that there's a reluctance to change, especially if you're in a position of power in the energy business. You know, hey, you want to sell your natural gas, you want to sell oil, you want to sell coal. But also now you have this source of energy that has been with us for since the 1950s on a commercial basis what's wrong with commercial nuclear power which i'll come back to as well but that is another superior source to fossil fuels although we still need obviously our plastics and a number of other things that fossil fuels provide and that everything that we're talking about including the fertilizer is coming from extractive industries that means mining but something else exactly. you queued me up here what about that middle class the other couple billion people on this planet that have not got to enjoy what some of the West has enjoyed in terms of middle class, Ian, should we as the West deny those other few billion people the opportunity to have a middle class life? Well, you've hit on a couple of points there. I'll just briefly go into fossil fuels before I answer about middle class life. There were some parts of the world, like the Ruhr in Germany and like um, Victoria in Australia, where brown coal provided electricity. Now those brown coal seams were up to 200 feet thick. Electricity was produced for three cents a kilowatt hour. No nuclear, no black coal, no hydro could do it at that, at that price. Um, and that is just an accident of geology. There are other areas in the world, say like Ecuador, where they have very heavy rainfall. They spent their oil revenues in building airports, universities, uh, roads and dams for hydroelectricity. And Ecuador is producing huge amounts of hydroelectricity at about four or five cents a kilowatt hour. So um, your resources are very much dependent upon the geology and your geography. So some countries like the central part of US, Pennsylvania, etc., like Eastern Australia, uh, like uh, parts of um, South Africa, are very, very rich in really good quality black coals. And these coals in the Northern Hemisphere tend to be a little bit more sulfur rich than those in the Southern Hemisphere. They're slightly different age and there's reasons for that. And so in some parts of the world, um, coal is very, very cheap. We cannot escape the fact that we need coking coal to make steel. And the world we live in is one of steel, concrete, plastic and fertilizers. So they have bought 
us the middle class. Now, we have people moralising about how evil it is to burn fossil fuels, to um, which actually create a huge amount of employment, far more employment than any than any renewables. They claim it's sinful, and and they argue from the moral perspective that we shouldn't be doing this. Well, a third of the world doesn't have a, have electricity. They sit in little humpies where they burn twigs and dung and leaves for their cooking and heating. That gives out carcinogenic fumes. That kills women and children. Is that moral to deny those people cheap, reliable electricity, whatever the source is? We also have people swanning around in their electric vehicles and saying that they're morally superior because they're not destroying the planet. Well, you mentioned earlier, we have to charge those electric vehicles. Most of the electricity comes from fossil fuels and we've been using 85, 84% uh, of the world's energy for the last 100 years has been from fossil fuels. It hasn't changed. We've just used more and more energy. And you charge your electric vehicle, you swan around in this vehicle, and it's got a lot of cobalt in it. That cobalt is mined by black slave children in the Congo. They die from cobalt poisoning, they die from rock collapses underground, and they die from rock collapses in open pits. Is it moral to drive your electric vehicle and to claim that you are saving the planet and you are doing a great thing for humanity when to get there, you are partially responsible for children getting killed. So the moral arguments don't wash. And in fact, I put out a book in 2021 called Green Murder. And this was an attack on the Greens where their policies kill people, whereas the policies that have taken hundreds of years to evolve through Western civilization are policies that are efficient and policies that actually build up employment for people and policies that actually create longevity and don't shorten people's lives. In terms of nuclear, nuclear for some countries is by far the best opportunity for cheap, reliable electricity because if you're putting in wind turbines or solar facilities, you get a 15 to 20 year life. With a nuclear plant, you'll get at least 60 years, the same as you get from a coal plant. The amount of maintenance is a lot less. So your capital cost is higher, but your um, recurrent costs are much lower and your life is a lot longer and you don't have to replace the capital for a very, very long period of time. So for some countries, um, they um, have denied themselves nuclear. I live in one of these countries, Australia. We, we are a very big producer of uranium, the second or third biggest producer of uranium in the world. We export that. We only have one tiny reactor, which is for medical isotopes. Um, so here is a country like Australia, where we've got tens of thousands of years of uranium. We have thousands of years of gas, thousands of years of coal. We're denying ourselves using uranium for nuclear power stations. We are attacking coal-fired power stations, which give us cheap, reliable 24-7 electricity. We are attacking gas for the same reasons. We are attacking hydro because apparently this um, destroys the habitat of a spotted green um, stripy frog with an X painted on the back. Uh, and we are going so-called renewable. Now, this is not renewable. These are ruinable. And the renewable industry only survives because of subsidies. They don't produce electricity. They gain subsidies. And they don't work 24-7. They don't have the grunt to keep an industrial economy going. So if you're in an isolated part of the world, such as in parts of Africa or India or Central Asia or Central Australia, then the ideal power source for you is a diesel genset or even a little um, modular nuclear reactor. It is not having solar and wind. If you've got men in a mine working underground, you can't have the ventilation system working off solar because you then don't have a night shift. Uh, you can't have the ventilation system working off wind because the wind doesn't always blow. And if you don't have people ventilated underground, you can't mine underground. So all of heavy industry relies on fossil fuels or nuclear or in some places hydro to keep alive. So I think we have had so much wealth generated and so many people living in cities that they are unable to see where their food comes from, where their fibre comes from, where their fuel comes from. And so this is why such ideas of 
destroying coal-fired power station and stopping nuclear and stopping hydro. This is where the ideas come from. They come from city people. It's a vicious cycle, isn't it? You get complacent, you get wealthy, you get abundance. And we are seeing the results of abundance in what I would call late stage nations around the world. Luckily, all of them are not at the same stage or the same point in their life cycle. You're absolutely correct in the sense of the lunacy that comes out of some of these places. There's still some sanity, luckily, around the world in certain places. Policymakers and lawmakers are there to do one thing, right? Come up with new laws and policies and rules every day. To deny the billions of people that have not been able to experience what we would call the middle class or just energy security, I guess, advancement, that type of thing is literally being attacked by certain parties out there who want to deny, oh, we shouldn't use air conditioners or it has too big of a footprint. It's a very interesting set of circumstances that we've gotten ourselves into. Um, Pick on you a little bit, Ian, and come back to, as you know, you've got a number of opponents and those opponents to you would probably say, Ian, you know, you're a good old chap, but you're just trying to sell books and you have it all wrong and you're climate confused. What do you say to that? Show me the evidence. I only work on evidence and the evidence is that human emissions of carbon dioxide do not change climate. I have been asking for 20 years for scientists, journalists, politicians to give me just half a dozen scientific papers showing me that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. I've been abused. I've had people obfuscate, but I haven't had those half dozen scientific papers. So as a scientist, I only think of evidence. Show me the evidence. And then we might argue about how that data was collected and what corrections were used and what data was rejected. But uh, my views are based on evidence. And they happen to have opened my eyes to uh, politics. And you used the words uh, late stage nations. Uh, Now, I think we're living in a time where we're seeing the destruction of Western civilization. And this is coming from within the attacks on the churches, the attacks on the institutions, the um, takeover of the education system by those on the left. And that just adds to my scientific views saying, well, I see there's no scientific evidence. If we look into the past, uh, unless you change all the laws of physics and chemistry, what happens in the past happens today by the same processes. So um, the evidence we see from the past is the planet is dynamic, that carbon dioxide has never, ever driven climate change. And you're now arguing that because you live today, that carbon dioxide is driving climate change. Well, my answer to you then is lead by example. Go and live in the bush, in a cave. And after the seventh consecutive day of hunting and gathering, when the snow is very deep and it's very, very cold, tell me about climate change. I don't like hypocrites trying to tell me how I should live my life. I live my life the way I want to live my life because I live in freedom. And what capitalism has given us is freedom. And I value my freedom. And if anyone wants to argue with me, it's only based on evidence. An opinion might be based on your life experience and reading and history, etc., all of which is a little bit malleable. Well said, Ian. So we shouldn't stop drinking carbonated soda, sparkling water, champagne, not. Your favorite uh, ale? Definitely not. No, you've got to do that because, as you know, um, the champagne manufacturers and the breweries are, are doing it hard. Uh, you know, you, you've got to support them. And we don't want to slaughter the cows either, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, I like my beef. And I think we humans have got enzymes and a teeth structure for eating meat. And to start arguing that we shouldn't be eating the most efficient form of protein, and that is cooked meat, is it's just madness. Uh, you yeah. can't get the body protein you need by eating bean shoots. It's just not efficient enough. So I'm very happy in this, this world where it's always been eat or be eaten. I'm very happy to go for the most efficient and tasty form of protein that my body needs. Ian, I guess there's something to be said about that. What you said earlier, I think the Romans did a little bit better job, although they, of course, failed too. And history is pretty clear. If you read books, instead of burning them, you do have these cycles of governments and societies and countries, nations, again, that you would come to that realization and it's pretty clear. Now, just on the topic of human lifespans, 
you're a geologist, you look at mineral deposits that took hundreds of years to form. Doesn't climate always change, Ian, over long periods of time? And can we see it as an 80 odd year life human being lifespan? Can we really comprehend that thinking or maybe with some simple study, we can comprehend it? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. We humans have great difficulty in understanding deep time, whether this be in astronomy or in geology. And in our lifetime of three score and 10 years, well, I'm more than that now, but in our lifetime of three score and 10 years, the chances of you experiencing climate change are very slim. Uh, we do get cycles and these cycles in your lifetime are uh, cycles, depending upon how much warm water you push into the Arctic, and they're, they're about uh, 12 years. There are solar cycles of um, 22 years, uh, and there are oceanic cycles of about 60 years. But there are other cycles which are beyond our lifetime, and these are the orbital cycles, which are 20,000, 40,000, 100,000 years, which get us closer or further from the planet. There are galactic cycles every 143 million years. And there are tectonic cycles every 400 million years. So if you happen to have a bad address and plate tectonics doesn't move you from that bad address, uh, you have a constant climate for a very long period of time. And Antarctica is a good example of that. Antarctica has basically been over the South Pole for 300 million years. And most of the time it's had ice on it. It's been temperate to tropical at other times. So as a geologist, we, we use time and we look back and see things. And we have many ways of deducing what has happened. Whereas in your lifetime, you might experience a very hot summer or a very cold winter or big floods or big forest fires. But that's not reflective of what's happening to the planet on a bigger scale. I'm glad you mentioned mineral deposits and a couple of hundred years. There is a great discussion in the scientific literature about some big mineral deposits do they take millions of years to form or do they form in much shorter periods of time and i have spent a lot of my life working on one of the world's biggest metal deposits the broken hill zinc lead silver deposit and i can argue from chemistry and mathematics to show you that that massive amount of of metal formed in a very short period of time geologically, and I'm talking hundreds of years. So we geologists are always thinking of that four letter word, time. That's well said, Ian, and appreciate you covering off what I had mentioned there and you know, really driving home those points. Uh, because we live such a short period of time, it's very difficult to see beyond that. Uh, and then of course, there's the question of wisdom transfer and lack thereof uh, in this current time in which we live. Just to kind of wrap up here on the CO2 stuff, Ian, convince the commoner, or I suppose the middle class today, about a simple understanding of carbon. I think you and I can agree that we're pro-responsible industry, we're pro-responsible mining. Uh, these are things that we need to have. They need to be here with us until we can find a better way. I'm not all for being as pollutive and wasteful as I can. Obviously, I'm trying to be sensible, reasonable, sane decisions. Talk some simple facts to the person who maybe listens to this chat that we're having. You know, these people are trying to make a living. They're busy working to pay for life. They have families. They have an area of focus and expertise, you know, whether it's a simple job or school or what have you. Due to lack of time and due diligence, they often believe that the headline narrative and what their government is telling them is true. And it is brought out with, of course, your best interests in our mind. And of course, they don't question, or at least not yet. But of course, people start to question as they age and they gain wisdom, experience, and knowledge throughout their life. But what would you say to this demographic who really hasn't had the time to do the due diligence? What would you say to them? I would say that all life is carbon-based. Uh, we eat and excrete carbon compounds. There is a cycle of carbon that goes between one life form and another. Uh, we eat life and um, life might eat us. So carbon is essential for life. The second thing is that it is element number six in the periodic table. It's natural. And carbon has a number of forms as native carbon, which we all love, and that's called diamond. Another form is graphite. 
Um, but we also have the poisonous gas carbon monoxide. We also have the gas of life carbon dioxide, which plants use to convert into the carbon compounds, which we then eat to convert into carbon compounds as we grow and we exhale carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is the food of life. The second thing is that if you are living uh, in the modern world, then to have the basic commodities you need, be they a coating of zinc on top of steel to stop the steel rusting, be they medicines, uh, be they fertilizers to make your plants grow better, you need carbon based compounds. And to do that, we often burn uh, carbon uh, compounds like calcium carbonate to produce carbon dioxide and the calcium oxide then goes into making cement. Or we will burn carbon compounds which give out energy, which then we convert into electrical energy or mechanical energy. So we live in a carbon world. If you want to escape that carbon world, you have to stop eating, stop excreting. If you want to live in a carbon poor world, then you have to go back and live in the caves. So the appeal I make to people is if you are really interested in saving the planet and reducing carbon dioxide, don't be a hypocrite, go and live in a cave. If you really want to have a, a life whereby you can eat, use land more efficiently, use our resources more efficiently, then you have to use all the technologies that have got us to the stage we are in the Western world. Carbon and its products like carbon dioxide are essential for everything we do. Now, if you don't like it, and if you can't live that sort of life, then maybe you should go and live on another planet. Very well. And you go to that other planet and you'll still be taxed. But anyway, let's... <laughs> Ian, we, we've seen many control wars over the years, uh, or you know, for lack of my better word there, I'm gonna use that term. War on drugs, war on terror, war on health via COVID, war on greenhouse gases, El Nino, global warming, war on climate, carbon, war on gender recently, war on free speech, as well as real wars. And you know, this is sad, uh, the real war part, and I'm sure you and I can make a few predictions on new ones, but how about the war on energy? How does Ian solve energy in terms of source mix, focus, people, and of course, quality energy? Because you and I both know that there's no form of energy that is really perfectly clean, perfectly green, or they all have a footprint. They all have a life cycle and they all require the binding of minerals. But there are standouts. If you had the ability to create a good energy mix and use good energy sources, what would you do? In very isolated parts of my country, we have various ranches that have little wind turbines to give them electricity that they need for short periods of time during the day. In very isolated parts of my country, telephone boxes and railway line signals have solar panels uh, and they don't um, require much maintenance and you can have them in the middle of nowhere. But if we are to live in an industrial society, we need a mix of energy which is uh, coal, oil, gas, nuclear and hydro. That very much depends upon your geology and it depends upon your geography. So we cannot avoid um, having those forms of energy because we living in a Western society consume a very large amount of energy per capita. And those keyboard warriors who are wanting to change the world should be aware that the servers and computers use massive amounts of electricity. And in their ideal world with less electricity, then they couldn't be a keyboard warrior. So my view is that we've got tried and proven methods of, of energy uh, creation. And uh, we have had commercial uh, coal and gas for a long period of time, for more than a century. We've had hydro for even longer than that. And we've had nuclear for about 70 years. And we may well have a nuclear fusion. Now, if we have nuclear fusion, this could be the answer to a maiden's prayer. And nuclear fusion for all of my life has been 10 years away. It still is. So. I'm not arguing we, we don't explore new ways of creating energy with a small footprint, 
But what we're doing now is destroying prime agricultural land with a very large footprint of solar and wind on that prime land. That is not very sensible. We have been able to, over the years, by using fertilisers and by having energy, we've been able to reduce the amount of agricultural land we need. If we didn't do that, if we didn't use fertilisers, we would have to halve the population of the planet. So um, by living in the modern world, we're actually uh, creating a much better environment than a world of 100 or 200 years ago. We've had, for example, in Europe, the forests have been destroyed three times. And one was for iron making, the second was for glass making, the third was for steel making. And it wasn't until we got coal that the forests regenerated. So um, I think if you can understand the natural systems and understand the technologies we use, then you can create a great life for people. The emerging country of China has actually been able to create a middle class by having a massive boom by using energy, by uh, using coal, for example, to make steel, uh, by using uh, cement, uh, by using coal-fired electricity for their factories. India is starting the same revolution. India has a lot of resources of uranium and thorium and also a lot of coal, especially in inland India. And India is growing, and India now has a greater population than China. Uh, India has British law. It's a very clumsy country. Uh, they, they work their way through things very slowly, but um, that will be the next great push for resources globally. India is going to need this. India is going to have to bring their people out of poverty into the middle class. Now, there is a middle class in India. It's very, very small. And, but India is a marvellous country with different religions and different castes, and yet it works. So we don't need totalitarianism, as China had, to be able to have this great economic revolution. We can actually do it through a democratic system. So my view is that we are constantly trimming the sails, looking at the cheapest form of energy, the most efficient form of energy, and it depends upon where you live as to what that form of energy should be. I think we got the foundational pieces of it, Ian, and very sensible way to go about it here, and, and you don't have to get too crazy in the sense that, as you said, with fusion, and I like fusion, but it's only 10 years away. Our carbon goals, only 10 years away. We're going to be independent, net zero, and all this. So it's only 10 years away. Good luck with that. <laughs> Prove me wrong. And I hope I am proven wrong in the case of fusion. Absolutely. We've covered off commercial nuclear power as, you know, a really good foundational source of quality energy, as you highlighted. Things like hydro, which in some parts of the world, hydro is being attacked. Uh, the U.S. is frequently removing hydroelectric facilities uh, in favor of a snail or a fish or uh, something else, which in some cases it could be justified. Other cases it's not. I want to come back to just your work in the natural resource sector briefly. Maybe if you can, mention a few past posts, maybe some current posts that you have without a lot of detail, uh, unless you want to, Ian, for the sake of time. And then I'd like to get your view, too, if you have one, of course, on uh, uranium. Uh, this is something that, that we focused on a lot at Smith Weekly Research, but your view of uranium and the supply troubles the sector faces to supply fuel to global commercial reactors. Well, I have a fascination with how mineral deposits form, and that's a blend of chemistry and physics and geology and mathematics. I want to know why we have this gold deposit forming in this place. How did it form? What were the conditions of formation? What makes it special? Because gold occurs as parts per trillion in most rocks, and we concentrate it to parts per million. What is that process of concentration and how can I, as an exploration geologist, look at some ground and say there has been a very large volume of water passed through this ground. This water was superheated, it was saline, it had metals in solution, and maybe we mixed it or boiled it and dumped out the gold. I like to look at ancient rocks which have been cooked up and um, deformed and to try to unravel what has happened. And if there's an ore deposit hidden in there, how do I find it? How do I look for clues of 
processes that took place 2,000 million years ago. This is what I've been doing at Broken Hill, putting together what was an old rift, putting together uh, the pulling apart of that part of the world and hot smokers, black smokers coming out onto a lake floor and then the system closed up, then it opened up again, then it closed up and then fluids moving along sandy horizons underneath the lake floor, others bubbling onto the lake floor. What actually happened? So uh, I'm absolutely fascinated with how mineral deposits form and that ties very much into exploration as to how you explore for them and what are the telltale clues that you're looking at. And then that comes into Brownfield's exploration. If you've got an operating mine, has the process repeated itself just a few acres away? Has the process repeated itself a depth? Um, has the process repeated itself in another terrain somewhere else? So I'm fascinated with the way mineral deposits are formed. And I uh, initially started to work uh, on zinc lead silver deposits. Uh, I then worked on molybdenum bismuth tungsten rhenium systems. I then spent a lot of time working on gold systems and copper gold systems and I'm still working on copper gold systems but I came back to mother fairly early on and went back and worked on the zinc lead silver systems. So I have a great interest in how mineral deposits form. Now with uranium, uranium is actually quite a common element. And what you have to do with uranium is to move it and you have to get it into solution. And generally these solutions are slightly acid and you have to move it in these slightly acid solutions that have a little bit of oxygen dissolved in them and move that uranium in solution and then suddenly do something to that solution to precipitate out the uranium. And normally what you have to suddenly do is to have it hit a carbon rich rock. And you will then precipitate uranium as uranium oxide or other rare uranium minerals. Now to explore for uranium, uh, as the uranium is decaying, it's giving out a gas like radon, it's giving out particles, which you can measure, you can measure these from the air. And so we have had quite extensive exploration for uranium worldwide. There's still a lot of uranium around. And once we mine a rock that might have a low quantity of uranium, say maybe 0.2% uranium, we've got to enrich that to about 3% such that we can make a yellow cake. And that yellow cake we can use then to um, create fuel rods. So that process is very, very well established. And we get false arguments saying, oh, are you mining uranium? People are going to make nuclear bombs. No, you need to have highly enriched uranium uh, to make something where you can get nuclear um, fission and that enrichment is to about 90%. So uranium is a very difficult substance to deal with because there's a lot of emotion associated with it. But you can get a good dose of uranium if you live in a house made of granite. People in Cornwall or parts of the US have got granite made houses. You can get a good dose of radiation, in this case from potassium, if you eat a lot of bananas. You can get a good dose of uranium uh, and thorium and potassium radiation if you entwine yourself in a naked body overnight. So there's radiation everywhere and there's a lot of work in evolutionary biology suggesting that we humans need a little bit of radiation um, to actually survive. So uranium is everywhere. All rocks have got uranium in them. Uh, it's generally down to parts per million or a fraction of a part per million. And again, we have to have natural processes of concentrating. And then what we do in processing that uranium ore is we actually replicate what nature does. We reverse the processes uh, to dissolve the uranium, then we precipitate it again. So um, I, the whole process is one of copying nature. And uranium is a natural substance. There are some parts of the world where from satellite imagery or from aeroplanes, you can show that there's a huge amount of uranium in the rocks. And these rocks are giving out radiation and they're releasing radon. That radon fills valleys unless you have a wind to blow it away. Uh, you have quite a high dose of radon in a valley. And if you're a heavy smoker, that's a fairly dangerous thing. So uh, uranium is quite well understood. Exploration for uranium 
normally takes place in very, very young rocks or very, very old rocks. Um, in between, it, the uranium is going through a whole lot of different processes. So it's a, it's a fascinating metal to deal with, uranium. It's something we've known about for a long while. Um, there's nothing to be frightened with uranium, nothing to be frightened with cyanide. If you're frightened of things like this, you'd be frightened of electricity because electricity will kill you and you will die if you put your fingers into a power point. You will die if you ingest cyanide. You will die if you handle a uranium compounds that might get into your bloodstream or might irradiate you. That's called common sense. Ian, that's good stuff. It's fascinating to us as well, uh, just from the supply demand fundamentals and of course uh, our assumptions on price increases uh, to sustain the industry going forward here after a long period of time post Fukushima in which the supply chain was broken. And then by the way, uh, just for the audience, Broken Hill, Ian's referring to the largest lead zinc silver mine in Australia that's been in operation, I think Ian, since about 1885, if I recall, and it's of course uh, where BHP gets its name. It was discovered on the 3rd of September, 1883. There's been continuous mining since then. BHP was founded and floated um, in a little village west of Broken Hill called Silverton on the 9th of August, 1885. And BHP stands for the Broken Hill Proprietary Company. So it has been a very long lived large ore body uh, and it's still producing. Uh, I found a new ore body there in 2000, and as a result, we've got a few hundred people working underground, and that's the culmination of all of my science. That's one of the most satisfying things in my life, to put the science into action, to persuade people to fund a drilling program. Uh, our first program had 52 drill holes, and we hit the new ore body 52 times. So we got something right. Um, so uh, it, it's a fascinating part of the world, but Broken Hill also has a halo of uranium around it. And that's a good indicator for mineralization. And um, I don't have too much of a problem with the supply of uranium because there are plenty of smaller uranium deposits that are on care and maintenance. It is the demand that fluctuates a lot and that's reflected in the price. And um, we also have policy, political policies that control um, the use of uranium and especially control cleaning up the fuel rods, taking out the unspent fuel and resurrecting the fuel rods. And this to me is probably the greatest commercial opportunity that my country has. In Australia, we produce a lot of uranium. Why don't we make the fuel rods? Why don't we lease them out to those who are using them, take them back, clean them up, send them back again. And at every stage, we're making money. Now that process was financially modelled in about 1985, showing that in 1985 dollars, there was more than $5,000 per man, woman and child generated if we had a cradle to grave uranium industry in Australia. We're a politically stable country. We've got a lot of uranium. We could easily be the uranium king of the world. And this opportunity has been missed for generations in Australia. Yep, just on this particular little sector, coupled with not only supply chain problems, but lack of expertise to get material out of the ground because it's either held up by regulatory limits on expertise or what have you, and supply crunch, uh, we're seeing this constrained, whether it's depletion of good or bodies, regulatory, can't get new mines permitted, lack of people in the industry at the university level. How many mining engineers are coming out of college these well, that, days? Well, that is the key point we are having globally <laughs> Mining has a bad image. So young people won't do geology or minerals processing or mining. And we have a massive shortage of people in the industry, especially mature, experienced people. And that mm -hmm. has a great effect on safety. So uh, the mining industry is suffering from a lack of available land for exploration, a lack of suitable regulation for uh, mining and processing and a lack of graduates coming through the system. And I'll give an example. Now, I'm a director of a company called Roy Hill Holdings. We produce about 65 million tonnes a year of iron ore. Uh, we mine a million tonnes a day of ore and waste rock. We are the biggest single open pit mine in Australia. Now at Roy Hill, uh, we wanted to open an iron ore mine in the Pilbara, which is an iron ore mine province of Western Australia. Western Australia is an iron ore mining state. 
Australia is an iron ore mining country. We, we, we wouldn't be having such a good quality of life if it were not for the iron ore and coal that we export. Now, for us to actually build the mine, it's not to operate it, but to build the Roy Hill mine, we needed 4,950 approvals from three tiers of government. That is madness. There's nothing I can say to that, Ian, other than this is nuts. Just for the audience, uh, you've had posts with Ivanhoe as well. You definitely have gotten around in the industry. I mean, Robert Friedman has got to be the world's greatest promoter, but Robert also gets teams yes. around him of outstanding people, and he's a visionary. He will have pegged something 20 years ago, which now is coming to fruition. Just look at the history of the projects that he's, he's successfully bought to mining or sold on. Uh, now, we, we have in the Western countries, uh, um, people like Robert, entrepreneurs are having real difficulty in operating. So my posts have been with Ivanhoe, um, have been with a number of the Hancock Prospecting Group companies, and they are owned by Gina Reinhardt. Um, uh, I've also been on the boards of listed companies on the TSX uh, AIM market in the UK, and the ASX in Australia. I've also been on the board of private companies. I've seen quite a spectrum of the industry. And the industry goes through slumps and it goes through good times. And it's the slumps that I look forward to. These are the times when if you've got a little bit of cash, you can pick up projects. And these projects then come to fruition in the good times. And this is what Robert Friedland does. I, I would argue he's the greatest mining entrepreneur we've had for a long time on this planet. Yes, full suite folks who can do everything in the industry. That's what we're lacking. As you and I both know, from Perth to Vancouver, there's no shortage of marketing people that promote something. Of course, it's going to be a failure. But what we're really lacking is good people who have that full suite and can put together, give you some credit, but then also Mr. Friedland and what he's been able to do with Ivanhoe Mines and what he's working on with Ivanhoe Electric and some of his other ventures. Just to have some fun here and just move on, because I know your time is limited and I appreciate you hanging around and talking to us. But environmental social governance used to be corporate social responsibility to some degree. And of course, logic and reason would always bring this in any business or industry, but apparently we have to formalize it with ESG. Should I only invest in companies with a good ESG score? I think if a company's got a good ESG score, you don't invest in them uh, because <laughs> uh, they're wasting too much time on functions that are useless. We as mining companies have shareholders. If I'm a director of a, um, say a TSX company, and we are using slave labor in Africa, uh, I will be exposed to shareholders at an annual general meeting and will probably get sacked. So um, we obey the laws and we follow the regulations. We don't need ESG, we've already got it. It's written in to the laws and regulations. And uh, it is certain companies which are not in the uh, jurisdictions of, of say Canada and um, the UK and the US, etc. they can get away with murder. And I've seen that working in third world company, countries. You have companies there that are polluting like you wouldn't believe, and you couldn't do that as a Western company. So any company that focuses on ESG, sell. I appreciate your comments on that and good people who know what they're doing. Uh, these are basic things, a bit silly. I guess I'll leave it at that. As you know, Ian, there are a lot of organizations set up by governments or groups of them that are unelected essentially by the people, but tend to make policies for the people or have significant influence on government actions and narrative control. Some of them that come to mind for me, of course, would be ones like the UN, the WEF, the IPCC, and OECD, and a number of other alphabet organizations. Uh, just your thoughts on some of these groups. They are unelected. They are not responsible for what they're doing and they have no skin in the game. And I think we have to very seriously think of funding these organisations. Why should we fund the UN if they're stopping us making money to give to the UN? 
Why should we be listening to the World Economic Forum? Why should we be listening to groups who actually haven't taken any risks with their own money? Fair enough. Ian, it's been a great conversation. I think we could certainly keep talking on these subjects, but uh, to wrap up here, I'd like just a few things. First, please plug the latest book series. Tell us a little bit about it, The Little Green Book. Tell us a bit about that, how people can get it, and then any closing remarks. In 2020, I was in a cancer clinic in Melbourne. I'm actually doing this broadcast from the same clinic. And I was there for 10 months and I wrote the book Green Murder. And this was looking at how green policies kill people. I spent three months in this clinic earlier this year in 2023. And I wrote a trilogy for children, and that is because I'm concerned about the absolute nonsense that children are being given at school. And the first book in the trilogy is for ankle biters, for kids who are, say, eight to 12 years old. And I go through things that make kids of that age laugh, and there's a lot of humour and coloured pictures in it. And that uh, volume deals with body functions, how you eat food, you eat cookies, and how you convert the cookies into poo and into wee and into farts. And eight-year-old kids love farts. So I I go into what a fart is and what diet you can have if you want to fill the school bus, how you the farts travel at 10 kilometres an hour, and so you don't want to mention a fart until it's really wafted through everyone, otherwise you'll be blamed. And this is to get kids laughing. Now, children today don't read books. And these books are essentially for the parents and the grandparents to read to the kids. The second one uh, in this series of the Little Green Book is for teenagers. And this is relying on what the average teenager says. They'll open the fridge door and say, oh, there's nothing to eat. Or they say, oh, that's not fair. It's not fair. And so I look at the current policies and how fair they are um, that African kids don't have the same life that you have. And they are denied electricity by the UN, which is the electricity you have. So I go into the basics of climate change and how climate has changed, uh, what the implications of all the climate policies are. But I've, I've written this in a very different language to the first book. And it's written for kids who are teenagers and having had teenage kids, and I've now got a teenage granddaughter in Canada, um, I, I very much got them in mind. And the third book is written for kids who are finishing up school or maybe even later, or parents or grandparents. And the third one in the series, uh, The Little Green Book, uh, is a summary of the history of the planet. Just looking at the geological history of the planet, what has happened, looking at the great extinctions, the great ice ages, how life has changed over time, how carbon dioxide has changed over time, and how nuts the policy is to restrict the use of carbon dioxide. And again, kids that age don't read books. This is directed towards parents and grandparents to tell their kids about how the world works. I've also got quite a bit on resources there, what resources you need for an electric car, what resources you use to eat in terms of what you have to mine, what you have to mine to make an EV compared with what you have to mine to have an internal combustion engine, and just putting the facts there so it is perspective for the kids. So these books have been published by my publisher, Connell Court Publishing. And the Little Green Book has been out, it came out at a CPAC conference in Sydney on the 19th of August. A week later, we had to do a reprint. Uh, it's not that we didn't print enough, uh, the book has just taken off. Um, and um, it, it is a, a book to to try to get at school children. It won't end up in school libraries unless parents donate it. It won't end up with school teachers because they don't read anything that's contrary. But it's meant to be a little bit seditious. It's meant to be questioning. It's meant to teach kids to be curious and to ask questions and to look for evidence. And that's the educationist in me coming out. Um, You've heard the exploration geologist in me come out and you've heard the corporate in me come out. I've got a couple of sides to life. And the last side to life, which you briefly mentioned before we went on air, was that I'm currently in a cancer clinic. I I come here for a regular grease and oil change. 
and I managed to acquire a very aggressive metastatic melanoma that got into the brain and into the lungs and all my gizzards. And when I came for treatment, the medico said, well, we're going to put you on this drug. I said, no, you're not. You're going to give me all the scientific papers on that drug and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Well, one of them objected. He said, well, what would you know about medicine? I said, I don't, but I do know the scientific method and I've been working on it for more than 50 years and I can tell whether this is a valid study or not. So with my medicos, I, we have gone through the scientific literature and I've now got a bespoke treatment of immunotherapy. If I'd gone the chemotherapy or radiation therapy route, I had a 2.3% chance of survival. Well, uh, they're not good odds for me. I, I don't mind having the odds against me, but they're, they're, they're pretty bad odds. So I went immunotherapy, which is basically building up your immune system, having various drugs, attack the proteins on the cancer, um, changing my diet. I'm now on a keto diet, easing up on and the carbs, having no carbs or sugars. So I've had to change from beer to red wine which isn't a tragedy and one of the drugs in red wine resveratrol is one that i take anyway so that has been uh, dodging a bullet for me it's been in many ways an epiphany but uh, i think if i hadn't have taken the scientific approach i probably would have been dead now my cancer stem cell count has been going down and the last count was the biggest decrease they've ever seen. Uh, the nurse told me just that an hour or so ago, she'd, they'd never seen anything like it. And that's because I've been very focused and very vigilant and thinking as a scientist. So I've written these books while I've been in a cancer clinic. Other people have been here suffering and moaning and groaning. And you know, there were some very, very sick people here, but I wasn't going to do that. I wanted to sit down and do something positive. And I leave tomorrow to drive the 750 kilometres back home. This is part of the wonderful life that I've had. I've had a wonderful life in the mining industry. I've had a wonderful life in exploration. I've had a wonderful life doing scientific work and I've had a wonderful personal life. And the best part of my life actually has been working underground. I just love it being in a three dimensional world with the rocks creaking and groaning and talking to you. And I'm there trying to understand what's happening. And so this book is a result of a very fulfilled life, trying to have the next generation not get fed garbage, not end up depressed, not have eco-anxiety, saying there's a great world out there, just grab it and run. Ian, that's great. You've got a lot going on. I appreciate you sharing with us your personal life and your battle with cancer and how you're approaching it because it's very unconventional and well done. Good on you for going after this and best of health on that and, and you recover quite soon. And uh, the book, some of the topics of the book, pretty well thought out in terms of how you put the series together. Good stuff here. Just to wrap up here on the last little bit, uh, is there a way for folks to learn more? Obviously, we already gave the website at the beginning, but uh, is there a way that they can contact you or do you prefer that they go through one of your contacts first? Well, I'm quite happy to give out my email address. I do answer my emails. Um, I get hundreds a day, but I believe it's good manners if someone writes you a letter as to reply to it. So my email address is Ian Plymer, that's all one word, at internode, I-N-T-E-R-N-O-D-E, at internode.on.net. That's my personal email address. It's not a company email address. We battle every morning through the couple of hundred emails that come from the other side of the world, but we do answer them. Great discussion. Really appreciate your insights here, and I hope our audience enjoys this one. And keep up the good work on all fronts. Take care, and my best wishes of health to you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for having me.